Okay, anatomy of a local anesthesia. So, teeth and tissues are anesthetized by common injections. We've seen this picture before. Remember, I hope you guys still remember this because the main thing that people would get mixed up is the PSA and the MSA. The MSA is in green right here, right? So remember, the MSA does everything including the mesial buccal root of the first molar. PSA does everything except that mesial buccal root. Uh, so that's important to know. And then the, men, the IA block, notice how it anesthetizes some part of the tongue. IO block does this part. Buckle block just does the buckle part. Um, just, okay. So maxillary anesthesia. So there's different injections. It depends on the tissue requiring the anesthesia. It's more successful on the maxillary than it is on the mandibular because the bone is a lot less dense and there's less variations in anatomy and landmark. And the pulpal and the palatal anesthesia is achieved by different injections. So PSA, like I just went over, that was the yellow part. Um, if you guys want, during this presentation, have that picture in front of you so you guys can look back to it. So the PSA was that yellow part that anesthetizes all the maxillary molars except the mesial buccal root of the first molar. That one requires the MSA. That was the green part. The target of the PSA nerve the target is the PSA nerve as it enters the PSA foramina on the infratemporal surface. And the adjunction site at the mesobuccal fold over the apex of the second molar. So it's right over here. The needle is inserted in a distal and medial direction to the tooth in the maxilla. And the symptoms and complications of PSA, there shouldn't be any symptoms. Um, the only thing is, have you ever, if you've ever gotten an injection there for like a cavity filling or whatever, the dentist might tap on your tooth and ask what you feel. So you'll feel them tapping, but you won't know what they're tapping with. They could be tapping with a freaking needle, you can't tell, or their finger, you won't be able to tell. So it's a very dull sensation. You can get a hematoma if the needle is advanced too far distal into the pterygoid plexus in the infratemporal fossa. And then you remember your cavernous sinus, we learned this about two or three exams before in histology. That's where if you use a contaminated needle or you do cross-contamination, that can cause a lot of serious complications. The MSA or middle superior alveolar block, this and this is that green part, and anesthetizes the pulp and the buccal periodontia of the maxillary premolars and the mesial buccal root of the first molar. Now, MSA is not present in all patients. If it's not present, you need to do ASA and PSA. And the target of the MSA nerve is at the apex of the maxillary second premolar. And the ejection site is at the mesobuccal fold at the apex of the maxillary second premolar. The needle is inserted at the mesobuccal fold until the needle tip is superior to the apex of the second premolar. Symptoms and complications of the MSA is numbness of the upper lip. There shouldn't be any discomfort and hematomas are rare. ASA this anesthetizes the pulp in the buccal periodontia of the maxillary canine and incisor teeth. It can cross the midline, and bilateral injections may be required. And the target is ASA at the apex of the maxillary canine. Injection site is at the height of the mesial buccal fold at the apex of the canine, anterior and parallel to the eminence. The needle is inserted into the mesial buccal fold until the needle tip is superior to the apex of the canine, so it's up here. And symptoms of the ASA are the same as the MSA. Numbness of the upper lip, no discomfort, and hematomas are rare. The infraorbital block or IO block, this anesthetizes both ASA and MSA. Remember, both of those meet up in the infraorbital foramen. So this anesthetizes the pulp, buccal periodontia, maxillary premolars, canine, and incisor teeth. And the target is the ASA and MSA when they ascend to join the IO nerve. So the injection site is at the mesobuccal fold at the apex of the maxillary first premolar. This one requires pre-injection approximation of the depth of the needle penetration. Notice where this uh, clinician is holding their fingers. They're holding this index finger where your infraorbital foramen is. Remember, the infraorbital foramen is right under your eye, and you can feel it very easily. If you grab, if you go right under your eye, you'll be able to feel a little dimple. That's where your infraorbital foramen is, and that's what the patient, I mean, that's what the clinician is pinching right now so they can make sure that they don't lose it. 
and the needle is inserted into the mesiobuccal fold, making sure that they keep the finger on the infraorbital foramen, like I just said. And the needle is advanced parallel to the long axis of the teeth to the foramen. Now, remember the IO block has a lot, it goes to a lot of places. So there's a lot of numbness compared to the IO block. They might have numbness of the eyelid because it's right under your eye, side of the nose because it's right next to your nose, and your upper lip because it's going down towards your lip. It has numbness of the teeth and associated tissues with ASA and MSA. There shouldn't be any discomfort and hematomas are rare. The greater palatine block or the GP block, there is this is no pulpal anesthesia. It's used for the palatal soft tissue distal to the maxillary canine. It's posterior portion of the hard palate up to the first premolar, and it may require additional injection in the premolar due to the overlap with the nasal palatine nerve. The target area is anterior to the greater palatine foramen, the junction of the maxillary alveolar processes and the hard palate, and it's between the apex of the second and third molar. The site of injection is anterior to the depression formed by the GP foramen, the midway between the median palatine raphe and gingival margin, and it requires pressure anesthesia. Pressure anesthesia is where you take a, a, a cotton tip applicator and you push down where you want to put the needle. That way it kind of confuses the nerves before. And the needle is inserted at 90 degrees until bone is contacted. So symptoms and complications of the GP block is numbness in the posterior portion of the palate. There shouldn't be any discomfort. However, if you accidentally anesthetize the soft palate, that patient will have a gag reflex and they might have a hard time swallowing or even speaking. They might feel like they're choking. The nasal palatine block, this has no, this is no pulpal anesthesia as well. It is anterior, is part of the anterior hard palate because the nasal palatine is at the top. It's towards your incisors. It's canine to canine and it requires prime pressure primary anesthesia as well. The target is right and left nasal palatine nerves as they enter the incisive foramen beneath the papilla. So right over here. The injection site is the palatal tissue lateral to the incisive papilla and then pressure anesthesia is performed on the opposite side. So this is what it looks like. Needle penetration is lateral to the incisive papilla and then pressure anesthesia is also continued during the injection. Symptoms and complications of the nasal palatine block is numbness in the anterior portion of the palate. And there shouldn't be any discomfort during procedures. AMSA, this is a single site palatal injection and it covers all the tissues of ASA, MSA, GP, and NP. So everything that we just covered, we can anesthetize all of those areas by this injection. And it goes from the second premolar through the central incisor. And this is mainly used for aesthetic dentistry because your lip and your facial features are not anesthetized. And that's important because let's say you're trying to fix a person's smile. You want to be able that they can still smile while you're working on them so you don't mess it up. The AMSA has very depth and duration of anesthesia because everybody has different anatomy. So it's best to use a controlled computer device um, to administer it. And they also use these devices on pediatric patients as well, but this is mainly used for AMSA because you want a controlled delivery of this um, anesthesia. The target area is the porous tissue of the hard palate right over here. And the injection site is the area bisecting the apex of the maxillary premolars, an area midway between the lingual gingival margin and the median palatine suture. Here's your median palatine suture. Here's your lingual gingival margin. It's right in between that. The needle penetration is at 45 degrees until tissues are penetrated. Now we're going to go over mandibular anesthesia. This uses different injections. It depends on the tissue requiring the anesthesia. Blocks are preferred in the mandible because of that dense bone, and the pulpal and lingual anesthesia are achieved by targeting different nerves. The IA block, or the inferior alveolar block, anesthetizes the pulp and the lingual periodontium. This includes all the mandibular teeth, the facial periodontium of the mandibular teeth, and the premolar teeth. The IA block is the most common injection, but it's not always first. It's not initially successful at all times. It has anatomical variation. Bilateral injections are not recommended because you want to be able to pay, because if you do it on both sides, the patient will have difficulty with speech and swallowing as well. 
So the target is at the superior to the entry of the IA nerve into the mandibular foramen. Aesthetic must, an aesthetic must be deposited within one millimeters of the target area. And remember that picture how I showed you half the tongue was also um, numb? That is because the lingual nerve can also get anesthetized with the IA block. Um, when I had my cavity filled on my molar, they used the IA block. And the reason that I know this is because that half of my tongue was nerve. They also anesthetized my lingual nerve by accident because they are so close together. Here's your inferior alveolar nerve and here's your lingual nerve. They are so close together that the lingual nerve usually gets anesthetized as well with the IA block. The adjunction site are the mandibular tissues on the medial border of the mandibular ramus. Hard tissue landmarks are loose are to locate this site is the coronoid notch and the occlusal plane. So the way that you would do this is you would retract the buccal fat pad. Here's that coronoid notch. Here's a pterygomandibular fold. The mirror is retracting the tongue and you want to go right in this area. An entry is contralateral mandibular second premolar. So you're not starting on the same side. You go on the opposite side and you go in from here. The needle is inserted into the tissues of the pterygomandibular space. It must contact bone to reduce the risk of injecting into a muscle or parotid gland. And later when we learn about the actual and equipment that we use, we have something that we pull back on an aspiration so that when you contact bone or if you see blood, you can pull back a little bit so you're not inserting directly into the bone or into the bloodstream. Now this is important because look how close this parotid gland is. If you were to inject the parotid gland, remember when we learned about this in histology that the facial nerve goes, it's right over the parotid gland. So if you accidentally anesthetize the parotid gland or if you nick the parotid gland or something, your facial nerves, those can be effective and that can lead to facial paralysis. It can lead to other issues with your facial nerves. And complications and symptoms includes numbness of the, upper, of the anterior lip, that's from the mental nerve, Numbness of the tongue because you accidentally hit the lingual nerve. There shouldn't be any discomfort. Lingual shock occurs if you accidentally nick the lingual nerve with the needle. You have transient facial paralysis. Remember I talked about if it accidentally hits the parotid gland towards the facial nerves. Paresthesia, which is abnormal sensation or burning or prickling. And this can lead to trauma to the lingual nerve. The long buccal nerve is anesthesia of the buccal periodontium and the mandibular molars. That's right here. So that target area is located on the anterior border of the mandibular ramus. You're just going parallel with them teeth. Injection site is the buccal tissues distal and buccal to the most distal molar. So right over here. Needle penetration is distal and buccal to the most distal molar. The mental block this is anesthesia for the facial periodontion with the mandibular premolars and anterior teeth. It does not provide pulpal or lingual anesthesia. The incisive block anesthetizes the pulp and the facial tissues of the mandibular. So this incisive block takes over for what mental block can't do. Um, and the, it goes to the teeth anterior to the mental foramen. No lingual anesthesia for involved teeth. So pulp and facial is for incisive. Uh, facial is only for mental. So target areas is both for mental and incisive blocks is anterior to the mental foramen, usually between the first and second premolars at the apices. And the injection site is probed anterior to the depression created by the foramen at the height of the mesial buccal fold. It is more, more anesthetic is injected for the incisive injection and then you use pressure to disperse it towards the incisive nerve. Okay, so I'm going to stop here because this only lets me record 15 minutes and then we're going to start at Galgate for the next video.